In the following video, I'll be sharing insights and testimonies relating to conquering diabetes. Among other things, I'll be discussing the power of time-restricted eating in beating diabetes and how by setting up your days with limited windows of eating, it can make a huge difference. You'll also learn of a 66-year-old woman who changed her eating habits, dropped 60 pounds, and now she goes backpacking in the mountains. We will be continuing to look at some of the comments and some of the wonderful testimonies and reports and a few questions. Uh, we'll start out with uh, a statement. This person says, low carb and high fat. Lost another three pounds now with a total of 59 pounds. Doing three days a week with intermittent fasting, two of those days with 16, 8, one day 20 slash 4. Now, if you don't know what that means, 16, 8 means uh, out of your 24 hours of a, of a day, 16 of, of those hours you don't eat at all. Eight hours is where you squeeze in your meals. Some people could squeeze in three meals in those eight hours, some maybe two. Uh, 20 slash 4 means out of the 24 hours of the day, uh, you don't eat 20 uh, of those hours. You don't eat a thing. You just drink some water, maybe have uh, a, cu a cup of coffee or tea, but no sugar. And then four hours, you squeeze in your eating time. So we call that an eating window of four hours, or a 16, 8 means you have an eating window of eight hours, eight hours where you eat. 16 hours where you don't eat. So this person has three days where they do that, and then the rest of the time, apparently, they just eat their three meals as usual. Uh, they say, it got me boosted to lose again after a stall in weight loss. I'm at my goal weight now. My fasting morning sugar blood sugar test is now in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. 70s and 80s, that is just awesome. Used to be around 140 diabetic levels. 140 in the past, now 70s and 80s. Do you realize just how powerful, how amazing that is? I want to thank you so much because, yes, I started looking into the keto diet, but you taught me how to keep checking my before and after eating blood sugar results. Well, yeah, that, that is an important part of it, to see how foods affected me because everyone is different. Thank you and God bless you. Well, uh, the person says they went keto, they kind of stalled, they did some intermittent fasting, and uh, they have lost a lot of weight. Their numbers are beautiful. I mean, their numbers are about like what you would expect a teenager to be. <laughs> so just amazing. The power of time-restricted eating. And sometimes I think I don't say enough about it because I, I talk a lot about low carb and, and that's kind of the cornerstone of how you beat diabetes. But intermittent eating, don't take that for granted. Don't take it lightly. Don't think of that as just, well, that's just a little tiny piece of the puzzle. It is a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, the intermittent, the time restricted eating or the intermittent fasting. And, and I don't like to use intermittent fasting because it gives you the sense that you're going you know, without eating for days on end. To me, that's what fasting often used to mean. But when we talk about intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, we simply mean you don't eat all day long, which is what most people tend to do. You get up in the morning, you have a snack, then you have your breakfast. I don't know if you've seen Lord of the Rings, but they talk about first and second breakfast. <laughs> and some people have a first breakfast, and then a midday snack, and then a lunch, and a mid-afternoon snack, and they're just grazing, grazing, grazing all day long. And that is the absolute worst thing you can do to get your, uh, to, to have good blood sugar. It just is going to kill any efforts you make. Even if you're doing low carb, it's not the best idea. Even if you're doing low carb snacks, better to have your food, close up the shop and wait until the next meal. Anyway, they, they do time restricted eating or, or intermittent fasting several days out of the week. Now, in a way, I'm similar. I, I like to get my dinner meals done uh, by seven o'clock, you know, start eating at six, six fifteen, six thirty, the latest. And then close up shop by seven for sure. And then don't touch another bite until next morning around eight thirty or nine. And you're giving your body time to rest. You're giving autophagy time to recreate your cells. 
uh, you're, you're lowering your insulin levels. It, there's just no end to the benefits, and studies have shown the, the phenomenal benefits of uh, restricting the window of time where you're eating. So uh, it, it definitely works. In my case, I will take usually three days out of the week where I'll eat three meals and four days out of the week where I'll eat either two meals uh, over the course of about six and a half hours or sometimes one meal uh, out of the day. So everybody has to work it out for themselves. I'm not here to tell you how you should set it up, but I am saying that if you can fast and if your doctor gives you the green light to fast, uh, uh, take it back, not fast, but restrict your time of eating. Uh, it can be a very powerful weapon just to go from eating all day long to squeezing it into an eight hour period. If that's all you do, that's tremendous. But in many cases, you can squeeze it into a six-hour period or a five-hour period. And the more you squeeze your eating time into, let's say you don't start eating till noon and then you're done by five. That's a five-hour window. Uh, the more you do that, the stronger uh, you'll see, uh, the stronger effect it'll have on your blood sugar in dr bringing it down, especially if, if in that window of eating, you're eating low-carb. So this person has had tremendous success, lost all kinds of weight, and went from 140s for fasting glucose to 70s and 80s. <laughs> I almost never. Once in a while, I'll see a, a 70s, but uh, most time it's 80s and 90s for me. So they're doing better than I am, and I'm supposed to be their mentor, but they they could mentor me. All right. This lady says, my husband and I started keto, the low-carb, high-fat lifestyle, January of this year. Uh, I've lost 60 pounds. Wow. Let's play that again. I've lost 60 pounds. I've dropped from a size 16 to a size 8. My husband has lost over 65 pounds. Uh, his, uh, she tells how his doctors, he was on 13 medications. 13, I, I, I can't even imagine that. 13 medications. And he asked the doctors, could he ever get off any of those medications? They said no. But today, he's lost 65 pounds. He's off all but one of his heart medications. Uh, and the last one, he's just taking sporadically. Um, so she says, I'm 66. This is not a young couple. She's 66. She says, I'm not on any medication. My husband's going to turn 70. And she talks how she, uh, who was uh, uh, overweight and just in terrible health, lost all this weight. She says, I backpacked recently into, the, into Colchuck Lake in the Alpine Wilderness near Leavenworth, Washington. Don't know anything about that. But she says, with my twin sister... So two 66-year-old ladies backpacking, <laughs> I love it, says uh, she was one that got us convinced to try the keto lifestyle. I carried over 30 pounds as she backpacked. She had over 30 pounds weight on her back. Uh, her sister carried almost 40. We hiked an elevation gain of 2,200 feet in 4.2 miles. We camped two, day, two nights and three days, even got to do what's called bouldering in the huge monolithic boulders at the bottom of Colchuck Mountain and Dragon's Tail Mountain. I never would have been able to do this with an extra 60 pounds on me. Wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Uh, just hearing these reports is so wonderful. Uh, more active. Life's more fun when you're healthy. Uh, you know, if you're drowning and you're, you're doing all you can, can, you can do just to keep your head above the water so that you don't go under for the last time, uh, you're not going to make any progress. You're not going to be able to move forward. It's all you can do just to stay alive. That's all you can do. And for some people, their health is so poor, all they can try to do is survive from one day to the next and just try to make it. But when your health is good, you, you do things like this lady's describing. You go hiking. You go backpacking. You enjoy your life. You enjoy your spouse more. Life is just so much better being healthy than it is being sick and being weak. And when diabetes hits you, it will make you weak, my friend, very weak. But as you get victory over it, you'll gain your strength back. So beautiful, beautiful story. This person says, I remember when the USDA came out with that food pyramid and my mom looked at it and was shocked. And she said, that's how they fatten up livestock. 
In other words, they give them a lot of carbs. You know, at the food pyramid, if you remember, had all the carbs at the bottom. You had your bread and your rolls and your grains and your rice and all these starches and carbs. And that's supposed to make up the bulk of all that you eat. And the mom takes a look at it and says, well, that's how they fatten up livestock. Well, yeah, if you want to fatten a cow, give it corn. If you want, if you want to fatten a goose, give it grain. Give it, uh, you know, f- they they talk about foie gras or whatever it is, and how they fatten those geese up and fatten their livers up by forcing grain uh, down their mouths, down their throats. You know, polar bears and lions eat meat, but uh, they don't get out of shape. Uh, they're healthy. They don't get diabetes. They don't get fat. Tigers and cheetahs are meat eaters, but they never get diabetes. They don't get fat. They're in great shape. Uh, you never see a cheetah carb loading before he goes on a hunt. <laughs> they don't do that. And so, uh, you know, the idea that we need carbs, we need bread to live, we need rice to live, we don't, my friend. Uh, to have it occasionally, and if it's especially if it's brown rice or whole grain bread, to have it occasionally is not a big sin. It's, you know, you can probably get away with it, and it might be just fine. But to make it, you know, your life to constantly have bread and rice on your plate at every meal, and grains and breakfast cereals, uh, just not good. And especially for diabetics, if you haven't crossed that line yet, haven't crossed that boundary. Maybe you can get by with it for a while, but really not good for anybody as far as I'm concerned to do much of that. 